I still believe that all negotiation happens before you sit, sit down at the table. Um, the big stuff. It's fundamentally supply demand. I just have always seen it that way. So it's like, if I want to have crazy terms to get into a relationship with a girl, for example, if I have no demand for me, it's going to be very hard for me to get my terms. If I have a line out the door, I can ask a hundred people and one of them will say yes to my terms, mm -hmm. right? So one is what's the value that I bring? Two is what are my skills at negotiating, capturing as much of that value as possible? Three, and this also hints at supply demand, which is how many other people are available who can do that same thing. This is like a common one with like a sales guy, right? So it's like, okay, well, I'm, I brought in 3 million this year for the business. It's like, okay, well, your ability to negotiate the value, fine. You might be good at sales and be able to, you know, go back and forth. But I've got 10 other guys who can do the exact same thing as you. You were just selling Candida Baby. You were selling something very, very attractive. Right. And then finally, it's what's the risk that's taken on? And that's actually the, the most recent one, which sounds silly on an investor podcast to bring that up. But we were talking to a, a high level uh, employee that we wanted to bring in. And he was like, hey, I would like shares of the business kind of up front because I'm going to be, you know, foregoing this other stuff. Basically, the TLDR was you want to be compensated as a business owner without taking on the risk of a business owner. Unless you're willing to put the same amount of skin in the game as I am or a business owner would in your Position. When you started. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seven years ago. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, then that's, that's not appropriate. So from your perspective, it should be about their opportunity cost, one of your competitors, and you don't have to offer much more just yeah. because they're-, they're I want people to be happy, to be yeah. very clear. Like, what would it take? It still is always one of my, one of my favorite questions. If, if I have somebody who's one of one who can create a ton of value, then the supply demand shifts in their favor. You've taught me, by the way, about A players, not uh, like- giving them what they want at the margins. Don't be cheap with A players, even yeah. though they negotiate hard. I've learned so much from Layla about business. She was really the one who's pushed me to be like, let's pay above market. And I was like, why pay above market? Let's pay market. Yeah. <laughs> like, why pay above market? Because you get so much more. So on one level, you'll be able to attract the A players if you're paying above market. But I think that once the person comes in the door, all of their behavior is gonna be predicated on the, the reinforcement loops that you have within the business. And so I, I think that it's the ticket of entry like the comp is the ticket of entry, but all their performance is going to be based on how well they are managed and led and their opportunities for growth. Um, and honestly, just like how much they sync within the culture of the business based on how we do things. And if they're rewarded frequently for doing things the way we want them to be done that make us the most money, then they're going to be, they're going to really like working here. And then that will ultimately like the big Vegas headlights for A plus talent is unlocking discretionary effort. I want someone's shower time. And I'm open about that. If someone works based on threat of punishment, which is that you lose your job, right? Then you will get as much effort as required to not lose your job. For the most skilled people, that requires the least effort for them to do as little as required to keep their job. And those are the people that you lose the most alpha on in terms of how much they could add if they really tried. I mean, if you wanted to zoom all the way out, like Layla and I's purpose of, of all of this stuff is to show that having a way of running a company that is off of praise, not punishment, is a more profitable way to run a business. And people don't hate you. But no one's going to believe us until we have multiple billions and then people then ask. But that is our entire the, thesis. The, Daniel's the, here. He'll, he'll vouch for it. <laughs> and the unlocking discretionary effort, is that only captured through equity? Could that be captured through salary? And how do you... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't have to be equity at all. I think it's just how you treat people. Uh, whether they're rewarded for going above and down. And I think reward cycles are way too latent in most people's businesses. And arbitrary. Yeah, well, latent in terms of like delayed. If someone does something, we want to reward in minutes. A paycheck is so hard to attribute a behavior that you did. My closest friend, Dr. Kashi, is like a behavioral scientist, you know, genius guy. He showed me this chart and it like, it changed the way I saw everything. He said, this is a chart of how to train a dog, how to sit. On one vector it had, yeah, number of attempts to, until they learn the trick and how delayed the trainer was before they gave them a treat when they sat. Mm. And so if you gave the dog the treat immediately, it took a couple of times and they learned how to sit because we reward them immediately after they did. So they could, they could tie the two together. If you waited five seconds, it would be like 20 tries. If you waited 45 seconds, it was a gazillion tries. After a minute, the dog was untrainable. It would never learn how to sit. Now, what, where it gets like the two one version of this is, but you still continue to give them a treat, which means you were training them. You were just training to do some, them to do something else. And so I think about this a lot within the context of compensation systems, but comp with you know paychecks is at such a delay that it's a very effective way of getting someone to join your company and a very terrible way of getting them to work as hard as they can. Without us sounding like psychopaths, <laughs> do, you, do you believe in operant conditioning? So yes, if somebody 100%. does something and you give them a bonus on Friday? 100%. And do you think there's any exceptions to operant conditioning? I don't even believe in free will. Tell me more. Well, we behave in ways that we have been rewarded for in the past. If you can control all the variables, you can control someone's behavior. Now that sounds like psychopath stuff, yeah. but 
I don't see it that way. I just see it as more of a statement of fact. If I wanted everyone in here to take all of their clothes off, I could guarantee you that I could do it. I would just raise the temperature in this room until a point and we just stay in here until and I'd lock the doors and I raise the temperature and then eventually all of us would take our clothes off. And so if I can change the conditions to get a behavior, then did that person have free will? And so B.F. Skinner is one of the, you know, the, the, the forefathers of this behavioral. He has this quote that I just love and it'll be at the beginning of one of my books, but everyone says that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. He said, false. He said, if I salted the horse's mouth and I dehydrated the horse for weeks and then I put its mouth right in front of water, I can veritably guarantee that it will drink. When I think about like sales processes for that reason is that there is a perfect sales process. There is a way that we can get it so that we can control all of the variables and every single person would buy. Now, it may not be worth the return on investment, which is a separate question, to create that. And then you have the trade-offs that you have in, within a business. But the same things exist when you're when you're when you're hiring someone. So like if I know we're getting into a little bit of the, the opposite of business, it's hard for me to, to, to stay away. But there's this whole concept of you know, hire for attitude and train for aptitude. And you've heard plenty of these yeah. sayings, right? You hire for the smallest skill deficiency, period. It's just that attitude has bundled terms in terms of language. And so if I say, I want someone who has charisma, charisma, if I say be charismatic to a child, even if they understand what the word means, they can't be charismatic. They have to then translate that into smile when you walk into a room, nod your head when someone's listening, speak louder. When someone says something, say it back to them. You know, it, it's a bundled term for 30 sets of behaviors. And then those behaviors are trainable. Now, I believe in the concept of hire for attitude, not aptitude, because to teach someone to be kind may be 50 different micro skill sets that I would have to teach. And that's probably not worth the return on investment. Now, in a higher level role, it might be easier to teach someone to be kind than to teach them 20 years of finance or just find someone else, right? We believe at acquisition.com that everything is trainable, but everything is not worth training. What about coachability? Deconstruct that. What makes somebody more trainable? Someone who is coachable, I would use at least our internal definition around this was just as intelligence. Intelligence is rate of learning. If we define learning as same condition, new behavior, then if I say, hey, enter this phone and say the script and the phone rings and then you don't say the script and I say, now read this script, phone rings again, same condition. And then they read the script, new behavior, they have learned. If I can do that in one repetition with somebody and it takes somebody else five repetitions, the first person is more intelligent, some people say more coachable, than the other person. And so I think you aptly pointed out that one of the number one things that we look for now is just general intelligence. Basically our return on investment for what we put in to train someone, we can get down one fifth if the person has higher general intelligence. And so this is where um, sometimes you have people who come in with lots of experience. And so they have a lot of skills, but they're actually not very intelligent. And so what you see is pretty much all you're going to get because the amount of effort it takes them to teach one or two more skills, you could probably teach a younger, junior, hungrier, more intelligent person in you know, the same period of time. But then once I've matched that person or once that candidate has matched the more experienced one, they blow past them.